Our next speaker is an alumnus of Philippine Science High School as well as the University of the Philippines where he completed his BSCE undergraduate course in 1979 and earned 24 semester units of postgraduate work in MSCE major in structural engineering. He continued his education in the United States when he earned a scholarship with the International Road Federation Fellowship Program and consequently earned an additional 45 quarter credits in structural engineering and a diploma in 1983 in Master's in Engineering at the Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University major in structures. He is a licensed civil structural engineer who has carved a name in design of horizontal structures especially bridges and ports. He started work with a stint at the Department of Public Works and Highways over a period of 10 years with the regional offices of Regions 8 and 7, and the last six years of which was the Bridge Division Bureau of Design, where he left with the rank of Head Civil Engineer in 1990. As a freelance consultant, he has had projects as a structural consultant specializing in bridges and ports on his personal capacity or with local and international consulting firms for projects overseas and countless local projects. He is a well-respected academician and was invited to join the Polytechnic University of the Philippines as Dean of the College of Engineering and Architecture. Among the universities he joined as a faculty member include Pamantasan ng Sod ng Maynila, University of the Philippines, and De La Salle University. At present, he is an associate professor at PUP and still a lecturer at PLM Graduate School of Engineering. He was recognized by ASEP as one of its top 50 outstanding structural engineer. Recognized, likewise, as a structural specialist by PICE. He was granted the rank of fellow by the Association of Structural Engineers of the Philippines, where he is a former president and a chairman and Chairman of the Committee for the National Structural Code of the Philippines, Volume 2, Bridges. He is active in the Philippine Institute of Civil Engineers, delivering lectures and seminars all over the country, presenting papers in ASEP and PICE conventions, acted as judge in the PICE National Civil Engineering Students Quiz Finals for several years, primarily responsible for making of the DPWH design guidelines Criteria and Standards, Volume 5, Bridges, 2015. Let us all welcome Engineer Alberto C. Cañete. Hello, good morning. Good uh, morning. Uh, I'd like to say that I'm honored to be invited to, to this General Assembly. Um, as Parang Dante said, you know, we were colleagues at the DPWH Bureau of Design before. And we were living together for one and a half years while we were at Virginia Tech. Uh, I'd like to, to add a little bit to the introduction. The important thing that I'd like to emphasize is that I'm a designer. That's really my bread, bread and butter. But... A big part of my profession is, of course, in the academy. Uh, and as far as designing is concerned, um, I've been designing, although I'm uh, well known in the field of bridge design, uh, obviously I've designed buildings also. Uh, ports, telecom, towers, and there was even an instance that where I was able to design a submarine pipeline in Peru. I've been doing several speaking engagements uh, around the country, even before the COVID, uh, uh, this COVID phenomenon or problem that we have right now. Uh, but uh, that was in line with my promoting the books that uh, I was writing. I'd like to mention that uh, I have already published two civil engineering, uh, structural engineering textbooks uh, designed for the undergrad. And this is uh, Principles of Reinforced Concrete Design 
and principles of skill design. So this is the first two books that I have published out of the four that I'm planning. I'm writing now my third one. And all of this is because of, uh, of, of the fact that uh, I'm not getting any younger. Actually, in a few months, I'll be retiring. I'll be 65. And then uh, we are, we are, uh, we are, it's mandatory for us to retire uh, if you're in the government service. And as mentioned, I'm with a state university. Uh, so these textbooks are actually legacy projects of mine. Uh, the third book that I'm, okay. The first two books, uh, basically concrete design and steel design. The reason uh, why I wrote those text textbooks because there are, there are really no honest to goodness textbooks available to civil engineering students here in the Philippines because what we have are just I see students studying reviewers and really there's no discussions there. Uh, so, um, so basically the students are, it's difficult for students to understand the topics in structural design, specifically concrete and steel. You see, it's always my belief that, you know, that books are better than the lecture, no matter how good the lecturer is. The lecturer in that uh, limited time can only capture at best 25% of what is discussed in the textbook. And the textbook, of course, you know, contains examples and exercises where you can test yourself on, on, on your comprehension of the topics. The second important thing why I wrote these two textbooks is because of the fact that for those who are taking up uh, uh, take not the structural engineering is a is integral part of your civil engineering curriculum. You have a lot of structural engineering subjects. You have RC1, RC2, steel, uh, foundation, earthquake engineering, uh, among others. For this one, as you can see from the cover, when you're designing, you you have to base this on the National Structural Code of the Philippines. And this should be, if, especially if you're a practitioner, this should be the latest. Unfortunately, especially in far-flung areas in Visayas and Mindanao, students rarely have a chance to get hold of a copy of the Structural Code. Uh, and yet, it is expected that students know how to use the code when they, they take the board exam. So that's one big reason why I wrote these two books, because I'm with ASEP, and ASEP is the publisher of the NACP. Uh, I was a former president of ASEP and a fellow of ASEP, and I'm also teaching, and I see the situation with the students. Uh, of course, if you're in Metro Manila, we, we of course, uh, for example, in PUP, we require students to buy the code. But if you're in far away, in the provinces, then it will be difficult for you to get a copy. Also, the copies of the NACP run out very fast. Uh, at the start of semester, in a matter of weeks, you know, the, all the copies will be gone. And then you will have to wait a long, long time, perhaps a year before ASEP uh, no, uh, will, will reprint additional copies. So it's really difficult to, to get a copy of the NACP. And it is important for, you, important for the student to have a copy of the NACP to uh, understand the, the design subjects. Because the rules are there and you have to design based on the rules spelled out in the code. So what I did was I wrote these two books in concrete design and steel design, which are based on the NACP 2015 edition, which is the latest. And in there, if you're going to read the NACP by yourself, it's very difficult to navigate, especially chapter four, which is in structural concrete. 
because they jumbled everything, rearranged everything. And even if you are, you've been a long time designer and you're trying to read the new code, you will be confused because you wouldn't know where the pertinent uh, articles in the code are now located because they they jumbled everything. Also, the code reflects the latest development. For example, in Chapter 5, which is for still design, for still design, for example, it now uses limit design, which is very much different from the concepts that, ano, that was taught before for a long, long time since I was a student. Until recently, still design was uh, done followed elastic concepts or allowable stress design, which is now no longer followed in the code. The new code follows limit design. And then from limit design, you now get the usable capacity based on the ultimate capacity you use following the precepts of LRFD or uh, by dividing it with a safety factor you by uh, follow the precepts of allowable strength design method. So those are the two main reasons why I wrote these books. One, if you, for you to have a reliable reference with a deeper discussion on the topics uh, so you can understand the topic to such a level na that no matter what problem they give in the board exam, you should be able to tackle the, the, the problems there. Or even in actual design, because take note that I'm a, I am a designer, a practicing designer. Actually, the design, proce- the, the design procedures that I use in the book are based on my actual practice. The, I, the spreadsheets, the design spreadsheets that I create for my own design, those are the steps that I discuss in the book. Now, the bad news is we ran out of copies of the two books <laughs> because it sold like hotcakes. I already released the second printing of the concrete book, which was my first book, but yes, it has run out. Uh, I release it with the together with the first printing of the still still design textbook, which also has run out. At the moment, uh, I'm using both books, uh, the concrete and the still design books, in my lectures at PUP, the Polytechnic University of the Philippines undergrad, uh, to refine it, and I'm doing some refinements or some editing because I still it's I still uncover some minor or type 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 of mistakes uh, every now and then or lacking data in the exercises for example some minor uh, and I want to complete the semester or where I'll be able to go through the whole book. Uh, the, the two books cover actually you know, my syllabus for what I teach in the undergrad. But uh, make no mistake, you know, masipag ako sa mag, mag, magturo. That's why, for example, in each book, you'll, you'll, you will see that it covers 11 chapters. And this might be intimidating to some other professors if they realize that I cover all of these 11 chapters in one semester for each of those two subjects. Okay, but those are, I covered all the chapters that I believe would be would be available uh, would be uh, ne- uh, necessary for a civil engineer to design a a modest building in concrete design. Uh, pala. I'd like to go back to this and I know that a lot of civil engineers have this mistaken notion that once they graduate from civil engineering, they can already design a building, which is a big, big fallacy. Take note that in undergrad, we don't cover usually uh, seismic detailing. And in the Philippines, which has one of the highest earthquake densities in the world, Seismic detailing is a crucial and important part in the design of buildings. 
And therefore, be before you can say that you can really design a building, you must know, you must incorporate seismic detailing in your design. So in my book, therefore, in Principles of Concrete Design, and I included the seismic detailing of, for the structural frame so that it, will, it can survive a major earthquake. My third book is about matrix structural analysis, which is I'm writing right now. And I, we could say that I'll be I'm about 50%. And then I'm targeting to release it by the second start of the second semester, which will be by March, maybe second semester at PUP. So we can, uh, because it will be used by that semester. Matrix structural analysis is a mathematical tool used by computer software to do uh, structural analysis, like the most popular one, which is TAD. So, but basically, all the softwares use the same method. And it is important that once you, if you're going to use that very powerful tool to analyze your structure, you must understand what the, the software or the software or the computer is doing so that you can prepare your input data properly and you can interpret your output data properly. And I believe that matrix structural analysis will become one of the core subjects in the new CHED curriculum. I mentioned that there, I'm planning to write four books. The fourth one will be in time for next year, where I think the K-12 students will be fourth year by that time, wherein all the these electives come in. And one of the electives that was uh, prescribed by CHED was bridge engineering. And I was imagining that it would be difficult to teach bridge engineering if you do not if a professor does not know anything about it and there's no so there's a need for a reliable reference for bridge engineering. Being an acknowledged forefront bridge designer in this country and uh, me having the experience of writing the bridge codes for this country. I think it's my responsibility to be able to, parang I place it uh, upon myself to be responsible to come up with a book for uh, bridge design, uh, so that so that if if they're going to teach bridge design as by mandated by the CHED curriculum uh, all over the country. This should be done properly so that it won't be a waste of time for the students. And that's also the reason why I am starting with this topic, Introduction to Bridge Design. Uh, taking, in, uh, taking into consideration that this has been placed as part of the new CHED curriculum. So now I'd like to go to, to my lecture. Okay, introduction to bridges or to bridge engineering. Basically, bridges are classified into deck girder bridges. And I'd like to say that this is the common type of bridge. Where the reason why it's called a deck, deck girder bridge is because the motorist can only see the deck. Uh, they don't see the supporting elements underneath the deck. So they will only see the concrete roadway deck, the sidewalks, and the railings. That's, uh, so this is, the, this is the conventional bridge. The conventional bridge make up more than 90% of our bridges in the Philippines, or I guess in the whole world. And why is that? It's because it's the cheapest way of constructing a bridge. Now, the limitation of a deck girder bridge is that it can only span a short horizontal distance. If you use reinforced concrete girder, that will be usable from a six meter bridge, a six meter span to 20 meter span. For pre stress, this will be for uh, a little bit longer, for steel, uh, also comparable to pre-stress, but can be extended a little bit longer also. But for very long spans, you need a truss. 
A truss is basically just a, like a beam, but deeper. And the depth of the beam is the height of the truss. So if the truss is more than six meters high, then you can imagine that you have a beam that is more than six meters high. And that will be very strong. And that can be used to span longer horizontal distances, like 100 meters, for example. Uh, because deck girder bridges can be used more uh, practical, practically only up to 50 meters, 55 or at most 60. For even longer spans, for short spans and long spans, you can use arches. And the good thing about arches, it is its geometry is very efficient so that you will need very little material to resist the load. So it's very economical to, to use arches. And also, aside from the fact that they are nice to look at, they are aesthetically superior. For even longer spans of 300 meters, 500 meters, or even a kilometer, you can use suspension bridges. But the problem with suspension bridges is they are too flexible. Uh, the, the transmission of the load is not direct. Uh, you, have your con you have your roadway deck, uh, and then you support this with vertical cable hangers. And these vertical cable hangers are in turn tied to a catenary main cable. And, uh, and this catenary main cable transmits the load to the supporting towers. So this, this, uh, this makes the structural system very, very flex flexible, therefore. And uh, for very long spans, uh, you'll have problems with, you know, with, with, let's say, wind. And uh, you might want to watch Tacoma Bridge in YouTube wherein a suspension bridge collapsed due to a 55 kilometer per hour wind, which is really below signal number one. So it's the still normal condition. So, and, and because of this, people were able to film the, the bridge uh, dancing wildly until it collapsed. Uh, Tacoma Bridge. Watch this in YouTube. T-A-C-O-M-A. -A. Okay. So, to improve this for really very long spans, uh, the modern way of doing this is with the use of cable state bridge, wherein the roadway deck is directly tied to the towers. The load does not have to pass through a catenary cable anymore. So this somehow restricts the movement of the restricts the movement of the of the superstructure to a much better degree than that of a suspension bridge. Nevertheless, let us focus on the deck gear bridge, which is the most common and what is therefore called as the conventional bridge. Uh, first, the bridge it can be divided into two parts. The upper portion is called the superstructure. And the lower portion is the substructure. The superstructure is basically your deck. It is designed for primarily for gravity loads, dead loads, and live loads only. The live loads are your pedestrian live loads or your vehicular live loads. Actually, both. Both are considered in the design. Your substructures are those supporting your superstructure. These are the ones that are designed for all the loads that are possible that can be applied to the system. So aside from the gravity loads, which are the dead loads and live loads, you also have earthquake loads, wind loads, stream flow, and many others. All of them listed in the, in the bridge code. There are two types of substructure elements. The supports at the ends of the superstructure are called abutments. So if you have a single uh, a bridge that has a single span bridge, 
then your supports are are those two supports at the ends and they are the two abutments. However, if you have a bridge with multiple spans, the supports, the intermediate supports are called piers. So remember, the, the term pier is also used for bridge design. Yung pier, hindi lang yan yung daungan ng barko. In bridge design, uh, a pier is a very important part of the bridge, which is the intermediate support of the superstructure. The superstructure, therefore, is made up of, for a deck girder bridge, for a reinforced concrete deck girder bridge, it will look like this. You have your reinforced concrete or RC girders. Reinforced concrete deck girder bridges are popularly known as RCDG. So you have your reinforced concrete girders, and then you have your concrete deck slab, your sidewalks, and your railings and then you can rip uh with the deck girder bridges the sidewalk and your railings are there permanently together with your slab and you can change this but you can change your girders to let's say if you want it to be longer rcdg can be used from 6 to 20 meters pre-stress can be used from 15 meters to 40 meters using standard asto sections so the standard axle sections look like this, and you you see this in a lot of our bridges. You see this in a lot of our bridges. For very long spans of 30 meters or more, you use type 5 or type 6. Or type 6. So for shorter spans, Let's say maybe up to 25 meters, then you have type 4. And take note from type 1 to type 4, the shapes are similar. And now with type 5 and type 6, the, the shape changes uh, markedly with the top flange now much wider. Now... You can have multiple box girders, and the boxes could either be steel. So you you see now a lot of multiple box girders for uh, in Metro Manila. The examples are those box girders with met, uh, metal pins at the bottom. You can see them in the Nea Expressway, and then in the new Skyway in the flyover that I recently designed over SLEX. Uh, C5, C5 x -Lex. So I, I had the chance to design the project that gave me a chance to go to France. To, to, to Paris. Okay. And then, what else? But you can also use concrete box, a uh, pre-stressed box. So the, the last pre-stressed Concrete multiple boxes can also be used. And the last one that I've seen it used was the, in the original Alabang Viaduct. But uh, unfortunately, you cannot see it anymore because this was replaced with Ashto sections when the bridge was widened and retrofitted. So they decided to totally remove the, the superstructure and change it with something new when they widened it. And then you can, you can have steel girders. Steel girders will be, let's say, competitive with, you know, with pre-stressed girders. They can be used from 15 meter span to as long as 60 meter spans. The superstructural elements based, uh, that, that needs to be uh, that are designed in by the structural engineer are the interior slab, the exterior slab, of course, the sidewalk is just treated as a dead load and it's not assumed to contribute to the strength of the, of the superstructure. And together with the uh, posts and railings, which are also just dead, lo uh, de dead loads. Uh, 
the railing is of course to prevent vehicles from jumping over the bridge uh, as well as to protect the the pedestrians from falling over you have your haunch uh, which is and then you have the girders and then and then to ensure that the girders will deflect or deflect downward together then you uh, you interconnect them with a diaphragm or diaphragms uh, but the diaphragms must be stiff enough to ensure that the girders will deflect downward together. This is important because the live load, which is in the form of a truck, of a very heavy truck, can be placed anywhere in the roadway deck. So, irregardless of where the location of the truck is, the girders must help each other work together to carry the load. And this is made possible with the presence of the diaphragm. To protect the top surface of the concrete deck, you put a future wearing surface, which is usually the form of a asphalt overlay. For the substructure, the abutment uh, elements are your wing walls. The wing wall is actually this one below. Uh, this is a pro slab. This is a heavy reinforced concrete pavement attached to the this part called the back wall. And then below that is your wing wall, which is actually a retaining structure. On top of the wing wall is a actually just a railing. And then, so this is your back wall, which is also a retaining structure. Uh, the coping, coping beam, and the riser so that you can set your elevate, uh, your uh, risers are used when you have beams that are precast and therefore the beams are of the same height. But the, if, in order to maintain a constant thickness of the slab, that means that the top of the gear elevation will be different following the slope of the road because the slope the road need the top of the road surface needs to have a cross slope in order to drain away the, the rain water on top of the of the roadway deck so you put in your riser in order to set the bottom of the gear elevation at the correct level this type of abutment is when you have spread foundations with the spread foundations or spread footings you usually have a target a uh, hard strata and the hard strata is usually uh, is usually at a certain depth from the surface because the surface is usually disturbed and very soft and you also have a lot of organic material and therefore not suitable to support your substructure or as a foundation to support your foundation. So you need to ex excavate to a deeper elevation. And to do this, you set your footing or spread fo footing elevation at a lower depth. And you connect this to your coping using columns or a solid retaining wall. With columns, you can imagine that uh, because you have to backfill this with soil again to complete the construction, the backfill material will spill through the voids in between the columns. And therefore, this type of abutment is called a spill-through abutment. But spill-through abutment are not possible in urban settings because each you know, uh, area of land is very valuable. You have side streets. For flyovers, for example, you have side streets. Therefore, you cannot do side slopes. Uh, your your walls has to be vertical. You cannot you cannot allow the soil to spill through, uh, either sideways or longitudinally. Because longitudinally, you usually you'll have you also have a road uh, underneath the flyover. So you will need a solid vertical wall, a retaining wall to do to do that. And you see this, you know. You see this here in Metro Manila, this type where you have a wall. But in areas where, you know, but this is, of course, expensive. So this will be a 
last recourse. Now, this is the configuration of abutment when you're going to use piled foundation wherein the soil is very soft or poor or there is a hard strata but the hard strata is already very deep. For example, is the depth is already at around 8 meters, then excavation to 8 meters might, might not be practical anymore. The cost of excavation and backfilling will already offset the additional cost of using pile foundation. So in those cases where the depth will the depth of the excavation is already deep, let's say more than six meters, pile foundations will be and will be more economical. So uh, you will notice here that you don't have the columns anymore. Uh, so you have your wing wall and uh, now this this drawing is better. So you can see that that part above the wing wall is the railing, which is basically, again, non-structural. Uh, we just designed the railings for collision, collision loads. Uh, and then your back wall, your coping, and then you now have your footing, which is called a pile cap. And then you have your piles. You will see here that the piles are embedded into the pile cap. Okay, now your piers. Your piers can be can have columns, uh, can have pedestals where needed, but pedestals are only used if the two adjacent spans are not equal, and therefore their corresponding gear their heights are not equal. Otherwise, if they have identical gear there's at both sides of the spans supported by the pier, then the uh, the the pedestal is absent or not needed. You have you provide the riser for the same reason. Take note for RCDG where they, if the girder is cast in place, you don't need a riser. Okay, you have your coping beam, your columns, and then your foundation, which could either be a pile foundation or a spread foundation. Uh, you could have a single column for two lanes or even... But the structural code recommends that you use multiple columns so that if anything happens to the single column, then the, the structure, the bridge structure will collapse. But if you have multiple columns and one of the columns gives in, there's still that other, other columns that will help uh, to keep the bridge structure standing or upright. For a bridge structure to collapse, you have to fail all the columns. And this is recommended by the code. And the code calls this as highly redundant structures, where it is de therefore uh, more difficult to collapse a bridge. Because to do so would require collapsing all the columns. Another type of vertical support will be a solid wall. But... This is shunned or discouraged by the code because a solid wall uh, for a pier is very stiff and stiff structural elements are a no-no in earthquake engineering. Uh, stiffer structures attract higher forces. What I'd like to point out is that in designing bridges, there are six disciplines involved. You have your geodetic engineer, which will conduct the topographic and hydrographic survey of the bridge. The topographic uh, survey is the land survey for the road approaches before and after the bridge. And the hydrographic survey is the survey of the river upstream and downstream of the bridge, which is about 100 meters upstream and downstream or five times the width of the river. Uh, whichever is longer. The geotechnical engineer will interpret the uh, results of the soil investigation and uh, soil test. And then the geotechnical engineer is responsible to, uh, to recommend what kind and the size of and the details of the foundation, of the supporting foundation or the soil capacities, whether you have pile foundation or spread foundation. What are the capacities that of the soil? <laughs> that will be available to, uh, to resist the loads. And then the highway engineer we, is responsible for designing the approaches, both for the geomet 
uh, geometric design of the of the approach. The pavement design is actually under the responsibility of the geotechnical engineer, but it's it's part of the design of the highway highway design or the bridge approaches. The road leading to the bridge is called an approach. And then you have your hydrologist. The hydrologist, basically you pay this guy just to compute the, the design flood flow queue for a specified storm uh, return period. For major bridges, uh, DPWA has prescribed that a 100-year flood is to be used in designing major bridges. For less important bridges, then these bridges can be designed using a 50-year flood. So basically, the hydrologist will have to compute for a specific bridge site what is the maximum flow, the storm flow queue for a 100-year period or for a 50-year period that, that, uh, that can happen for that bridge. And then once this is done, the hydraulics engineer will do the uh, hydraulics computation using open channel flow formulas like the, the Manning's equation or Manning's formula where you can be able to solve for, for the velocity V. Now, if you already have Q, which is the flow, which is, let's say, cubic meters per second, and you have the velocity, which is meters per second, then you have the formula Q is equal to area times velocity. And if you already have Q and you have velocity, then you can determine the area. A is equal to Q over velocity. And with this area, then you can, you can compute for the area of the water in the river at flood conditions. And you can set the design flood level. Once you have the design flood level, you with an additional allowance called the free board, free board to the bottom of your superstructure plus the height of your superstructure defines the top of roadway elevation of the bridge. And this is used in laying out your bridge to ensure that this will be safe from the flood waters. Because your bridge superstructure is supposedly is designed supposedly not to be hit by floodwaters. Take note that majority of our collapse of bridges or let's say maybe 80% of the bridge collapse is due to floods, not, not even due to earthquake. The reason for that is major earthquakes are very rare. But typhoons, we have typhoons, uh, a lot of typhoons every year in this country and we sometimes run out of letters in the alphabet trying to name all of those typhoons. Okay, so the hydro an additional requ uh, responsibility of the hydraulics engineer is to determine the, the erosion or scar uh, in the bridge and to protect the bridge against scouring, the effects of scouring during flood conditions. So you... Uh, the hydraulics engineer is tasked to design the protection works, riprap, stone masonry, apron, river retaining walls. And last but not the least, of course, is the structural engineer. It's basically the end user of the results from the geotechnical engineer, from the geodetic engineer, from the highway engineer, because the highway engineer is is part of the is is also has uh, a big input import important input in the layout of the bridge. Uh, and, but the structural engineer just makes sure that all the structural elements complies with the requirements of the code in terms of strength and serviceability for all loads that uh, can and load combinations that can be applied to the bridge structure as prescribed by the bridge code. Uh, you can, I uh, know, I suggest that what the way we do this is on uh, uh, people, you can type your questions uh, and then they can be read. I don't know, we can discuss your questions.
if there are any questions. We will now open the floor for questions. You may now chat or message your questions here on our Zoom meeting. Thank you. Sir Cañete from yep. Hubero team, uh, I don't know if, it is, if it's relevant, but what's your opinion in regards to the steel girder accident that happened in Muntinlupa where steel girder fell under construction? I don't know. I don't know anything about it. So there, there's, I cannot, I'm in a position to comment. And there's another question. Po. What are your advice to our CE students who want to be a structural engineer after passing the licensure examination? If you want to pursue structural engineering, you you have to go to the grad school. Uh, fortunately, we already have a doctorate in, doctorate in structural engineering program in the University of the Philippines. But in spite of that, uh, a lot of students go to PLM. That's where I'm teaching because, of course, you know, actually I'm the only st structural uh, professor there. So when students who enroll there end up end up with all of their structural engineering subjects under uh, under my class so all of them become my disciples so they'll they'll have let's say some of them have a, as ma as many as six subjects under me so one man team they become my disciples so it's more of a discipleship program at PLM and that's only up to the master's degree there's no doctorate level there but of course you know, the the fear, the difference is in my case is that I've been teaching for a long, long time, and I enjoy it. It's my passion. Uh, but I I have a very wide experience in designing, and I create my own design uh, spreadsheets or software. Okay. Even the frame analysis software, similar to STAD, I created that a similar program like that way back in the 1980s when I was still very young and still had a lot of time. I'm a bit of a nerd. I'm a product of Philippine Science High School, just, just to give you an idea. I might look normal, but but you know, <laughs> my my brain is uh, my brain is very what is this? malikot. thank you for your for your answer, sir. <laughs> Sana po lahat merong ganung yeah. brain. <laughs> pero ano? Pero pero mas maraming pera sa construction management. <laughs> yung mga gusto mag CM or but I have a lot of students in the graduate school na nasa CM lalo na sa ang trabaho nila are construction they are construction managers pero a very big companies and vertical structures at natatakot sila wala silang tiwala sa mga designers structural designers sila that's why they take up on Structural engineering major ano, in uh, uh, master's in structural engineering. Kahit units lang or subject units lang sa PLM para ano, hindi sila pwedeng lokohin or i-bluff ng mga structural designers. Kasi sa maraming mga structural firms sa totoo lang na sa sobrang busy nila ang tumitira mga junior, mga bata din. And they are not, yung mga seniors are not uh, I do not have the time to ano, to check or supervise them. Marami rin mga seniors na ano, na matitindi ang academic background, may mga doctorate, pero walang actual experience sa design. So, ano, hindi rin actually marunong mag-design. Marami rin mga designers na matatagal na nag-design, pero ano sila? Long experience pero wrong experience kasi hindi sila na supervise wala sila hindi sila na collaborate hindi nila in update yung sarili nila uh, so hindi rin nagbabasa ang dami kaya ng designer lalo na sa probinsya na hindi nagsisismic detailing <laughs> di, di nila alam di, 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 a lot of designer ano marami sa probinsya na not even aware about sis, sismic detailing and how important it is. It makes our structural frame, concrete stuck, concrete frame, ductile. They're just like teenagers or naka mga matatanda structure na nakabayagra. They are, they can dance and survive an earthquake. So yun yung advice ko. Okay. So kahit mag-construction management ka or kahit anong field ka, 
a background in structural engineering will be important. Mm. Siguro yun ang dahil lang kung bakit maraming structural engineering subjects sa undergrad. So, sir, let's go to the next question. Okay, so what's the next question? How much yung books po? And can our university... Uh, they, are, no, they are very modest yung price kasi pang, ano yun, eh, pang legacy project yan, hindi yan pang, hindi yan pang hanap buhay. 500 pesos each lang siya. Uh, so, yung dalawang libro would be 1,000. Uh, before, nagbigay ako ng promo na 2 plus 1. Wherein, pag bumili ka ng concrete na libro, libre na yung steel. Yeah, po. Uh, 500 pesos for the two books. The reason for that is, yung first printing ng steel na book, I was able to get a sponsor for the printing. So, basically, na libre yung, na libre yung print. Unfortunately, naubos na. Naubos na. So, sa so next na ano, uh, hindi na ako nagka-campaign for a sponsor eh. Because I have a lot of, ano, I have a lot of clients. I have a lot of ongoing projects. If you want to see, ano, and my my projects are exciting because they are iconic bridges. And you can see them at, at YouTube. You have Bridgetown. You can, you can tie you can look this up in YouTube kasi ang daming mga, ano yun? Maraming vloggers na cover yeah. yung mga tulay ko. Di nila alam na Pilipino yung nagtitisign noon. Wow. You have Kabagan Bridge, you have Bridgetown. I'm not the designer of Park Links, uh, but but I am I'm advising them how to, ano, I'm on board for the cost- current construction of Park Links uh, Bridge for the, no, I'm on board as advisor for the construction. And then, I'm the designer of the Cable Stayed. Yung ano, Tide Arches, yung Kabagan is Tide Arch. Uh, Bridgetown is a Tide Arch. They are iconic or beautiful bridges. Uh, Circle of Verde is Cable Stayed. Uh, Park Links is also Tide Arch. I I also have another, another Tide Arch, uh, ano, Mana East. I also have a, you know, another business almost finished. And it's also, all of these are covered ah, sa blogs. Ah, uh, Sakobia Bridge in Clark, in New Clark City. And these are very long bridges. Uh, Sako, Sako, Sakobia is 890 meters. Kabagan is 720 meters. It crosses, it crosses the Cagayan River, the longest river in the Philippines. So that's why it's quite long. Maraming, ano, maraming yung nagma nagwe wedding photo op <laughs> do sa tulay kahit hindi pa tapos kasi nakikita na nila yung mga arches eh tapos na yung 12 spans na ano na na arch superstructure ginagawa lang nila yung mga expansions aw yung extension kasi 1 kilometer wide yung ano eh, yung river banks yung yung flood plain niya is 1 meet 1 kilometer wide Although the river itself is only half a kilometer wide, but during flood conditions, yung flood plain niya is one kilometer wide. One kilometer yung, ano, yung bridge, bridges dyan sa Cagayan River. I have another incoming bridge, also Tide Arch in Tugigarao City, Solana, which is even longer than 1.6 kilometers. Pero the Tide Arches are ano lang, yung, yung normal waterway, which is around 600, a little bit mo, longer than 600 meters. Yun lang yung lalagyan mo ng tide arches. Tapos iba ng ano, uh, doon sa flood plain, you can use ano, kasi dry land yan eh, during normal conditions. You can use conventional spans. Pero doon sa river mismo, kung half a kilometer yung river mo, then you need longer spans. Ang reprinting yan, prob- probably by February. Okay, sige. Noted or po. later part later part of February. Tapusin ko muna yung semester para ano, that gives me the chance to double check all the chapters bago ako mag ano, mag reprint. Parang design yan eh. Mahirap gumawa ng design na let's say 300 sheets and drawings mo na mapaperfect mo. Ganon din yung libro. Uh, kahit na ilang beses ko na siyang print, meron, meron at meron pa din ano nakakalusot. So, Saka na yan, ah, this, this mm-hmm. books, these two books, concrete saka steel, first edition yan, 
which means it's for the NACP 2015. Pag ang ASEP nag-publish ng panibagong edition ng NACP, automatic mag re release ako ng panibagong edition ng concrete saka steel na naka-base sa latest na NACP. Okay, sir, That, last question. Yep. <laughs> From Frederick De Los Santos, this news last October 7, 2019 about the photos of a bridge that was built over seemingly dry land and nearly level with the ground in southern Leyte have been making the rounds on social media residents have long been wondering why a bridge was created even though there is no river underneath. That's a very, I don't want to use a very harsh word, dalo na si Comparin Dante, ano, pareha kami mga taga DPWH. Pero ang nag-decide lang yan siguro sa low, sa ano eh, sa lower level lang, sa district lang. <laughs> uh, dapat hindi, dapat hindi ganun. Uh, paano ka gagawa ng tulay over an, over an existing Ako. road? Mm-hmm. I think, ang basa ko dyan is ano, the soil is so soft and the thickness of the soft layer is very, very deep na hindi mo pwedeng i-remove tapos i-replace which, which becomes very expensive. Saka kahit anong lagay nila ng concrete pavement previously, laging nag-crack-crack at ang lumulubog, nagsisettle. So nilagyan nila ng tulay. Para bang ano, parang naglagay ka ng tulay over quicksand. Parang ganun. So, seemingly it is dry, pero sa totoo lang, napakalambot. Na hindi kaya mag... Kahit maglagay ka ng pavement, siguro kaya niya yung weight ng pavement. Pero pag dinanan ng truck, wala na. Lulubog na, magkrakrak na. Kasi concrete pavement mo, walang bakal yan eh. Unreinforced yan eh. And concrete is a very brittle material. Nagsawa na sila ng kare replace ng kare replace ng konkreto siguro doon. So that that was the case. They should have consulted a structural engineer. I would have just designed a concrete pavement. Walang walang bridge railing kasi ang bridge railing is ano is to protect the vehicle from falling over the bridge. If ano ang po fall over mo, ilupa din 'yan. Di dapat pavement lang. Tapos nilagyan nila ng pile foundation. Pero yung pile foundation di makikita, makikita lang ng tao. Concrete pavement lang. Nilagyan kasi nila ng bridge railing eh. Hindi lang mukhang tulay. And I don't even know kung yung pavement nila, nilagyan nila ng support. I would have designed it as a slab bridge with ano, slab bridge with supported by piles. But what can be, what should be seen at the top would simply be a concrete pavement. So yung motorist will have no, ano, no hint na, ano, na meron tulay doon. You are crossing, there's a bridge there, but the bridge is not crossing a river. It is crossing a very soft soil, something sort like a quicksand, something like that. That's from the engineer's point of view. Pero of course, hindi yan maintindihan ng layman. And I doubt if the local engineers can explain it properly. Isa lang yung blunder nila, naglagay sila ng railing, dapat din nila nilagyan ng railing. Para hindi nagmukhang tulay. Ano, parang ano, it make the rounds of the sa YouTube kasi that's that's it really looks very stupid. Yeah, nakita ko rin 'yon. We will proceed now to the awarding of certificate. Okay, so uh, I would like to call on uh, Dr. Michael B. Bailon, the uh, Vice MLQU faculty advisor and of course uh, uh, Dean Dante B. Potante for the awarding of certificate for Engineer Al- Alberto Cañete. Uh, Philippine Institute of Civil Engineers, Manuel L. Quezon University Student Chapter presents this Certificate of Appreciation okay, to Engineer Albert C. Cañete, Alberto C. Cañete, for sharing his valuable knowledge as a guest speaker uh, of the General Assembly 2021 for Structural Engineering with a lecture entitled Introduction to Bridge Engineering, awarded this 16th day of January 2021 by a Zoom meeting. Signed, Raymond Francis M. Manalo, President, yours truly, Dr. Michael Bailon, uh, Advisor, and Dean, Engineer Dante Potante of the School of Engineering. Thank you very much, Sir Albert. 
Congratulations, pare, pare Albert. Congratulations, ha? And, uh, and thank you for sharing uh, with us your expertise. Uh, thank you then sa lahat. I hope you have enjoyed my lecture. Mm. Mm, uh, no. Excited kasi ako pag nagle-lecture. Mm. <laughs> Sabi mo ba, mauubos ang oras eh. Hindi ka ma mauubusan yeah. na natatihin eh. Ayoko namang yayahin yung estudyante mo sa PLM kasi apaw na yung estudyante ko doon. Parang undergrad. 50 estudyante, graduate school. <laughs> Grabe. Sir, ano yan eh? SRO, standing room only. Kumbaga sa palabas sir, sa sinihan eh. Even sa ASEP conference, sir, talagang tumatayo ang mga estudyante ni sir. <laughs> Gra grabe, grabe. Lalo na ngayon, COVID, tapos sa internet, walang limit. Walang limit ang class size. Correct. 100 students, kasya-kasya. Okay.